Good morning, Sabbath School. We're so glad that you are joining us as we continue to study the Word of God on three cosmic messages. And this is a topic that we have been studying for the last 10 weeks. Last week, we discussed a city called Confusion, and today, Satan's final deception. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. Father in God, thank you for your mercy and for your grace. Be with us even as we discuss this serious topic, but one that has such great hope for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sister Jackson. Okay. Thank you, Brother Rodriguez. Um, as Brother Rodriguez said, we're into lesson 10. I can't believe we've, we've gotten that far this quickly. And it's entitled Satan's Final Deception. And we're still looking at the second angel's message. And we're dealing with false doctrines and teaching, teachings, as we have seen from Revelation. Revelation warns us that the inhabitants of the earth will drink a deadly portion called the wine of Babylon. Mm -hmm. These are false doctrines and teachings that in the end will lead to death. Um, do we have the, the slide? The, um, uh, but God has not left us. Amen. Um, he, has left, he has given us an antidote and the antidote to this spiritual wine is the three angels message. And that's what we have been studying this quarter. In this week's lesson, we will continue looking at the second angels message, Babylon's deception, but we will also look at the plan that Jesus has to save us from these deceptions and ultimately to save us from death. Now, what does Babylon stand for? Babylon the Great in the book of Revelations stands for apostate religious system. It doesn't stand for the people. It's the organization and the leadership of that organization. It, it couldn't be the people because God's people in Babylon, God has said, come out. So what's wrong with Babylon? Why did God announce its fall and invite us? to get out of Babylon. What's wrong with Babylon is that Babylon promotes false teachings and false doctrines. It does not promote the truth of God. And this week, we're going to look at the deceptions of Babylon. On Sunday, we're looking at the universal deception. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, we're looking at the deceptions of Babylon. And Wednesday and Thursday, we will be looking at God's plan for saving us from these deceptions. So Sunday, we're looking at the universal deception Monday, the immortality of the soul, and Tuesday, the false day of rest. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, the true day of rest, and God is calling us to obedience. Now, in Sunday's lesson, people, I just want to say that we are living in dangerous times. 
societal norms and attitudes have changed and they are still changing. And I know that you, like me, can remember some things. Let me give you an example, one example. Um, it used to be that when people lived together before marriage, it was viewed as living in sin. But now it's seen as a logical step to save money <laughs> or it's a rite of passage for couples before they decide to spend their lives together. It's okay. Um, as I was doing this research about things changing um, and how we just kind of roll into the changes, I looked at um, research done by the Pew Research Center, uh, a study done by the Pew Research Center. Now we know that the Pew Research Center is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, fact, think tank. And it provides information about issues and attitudes and trends that shape America and the world. And it conducts a lot of uh, a pen polling, a, a lot of polls and demographic research and other social science and religious research. Um, and it's done, it's done a lot of uh, religious research. Well, this particular study, they looked at, uh, they asked people in a number of countries about what is uh, morally unacceptable, morally acceptable, or not a moral issue at all. And so the issues they looked at was being married and having an affair, gambling, homosexuality, having an abortion, sex between unmarried adults, drinking alcohol, and <laughs> getting a divorce, using contraceptives. Now, the Sunday's lesson would talk about the way that seemed right in a man's eyes, but but that way is not right. Um, I only looked at the ones um, that they did other countries, but I only look at the American part of the study. And here are some key takeaways. I'm just going to give you these quickly. They asked people about marital affairs. And 14% of Americans felt that it was um, either acceptable or not a moral issue at all. So it, it, when we're looking at that one, we see that majority of Americans felt that that, that was not acceptable. We looked at abortion now, and that kind of was not on that same level. It seems that 40% of Americans felt that it wasn't a moral issue or that it's acceptable to do it. We looked at, they asked about homosexuality and 58% of Americans said it was okay it was, or it wasn't a moral issue. We looked at premarital sex. And 65% of Americans said it's, it's not a, a moral issue at all or it's acceptable to do. And it went on down the line. We got to, they talked about alcohol use, getting drunk. And 78% of Americans said it's not a moral issue at all um, or it's acceptable to do this. Now you can see how if we go along with societal issues, we see that there are things that seems right in a man's eyes, but they may not be right. As we see what is happening in society, 
We need to heed what Proverbs is saying. When Proverbs says there's a way which seems right, but in the end, it will lead to death. In other words, this verse is telling us that people cannot depend on the societal norms. They will be deluded and devoid of true wisdom and understanding. And true wisdom and understanding comes only from God. Um, guidance. As I looked at the book of Proverbs, I saw that guidance for living is found throughout that book of Proverbs. And as I was looking at it, I decided that one of the key um things that we need to remember from Proverbs in these last days when Satan is doing these deceptions is found in Proverbs chapter three, where Solomon says, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. We have to remember that. Now, the author uh, of, Revel of this first section talks about Revelation 9, 12, verse 9. Um, and it says, the great dragon was hurled down, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast on, onto the earth. The Lord has put this verse and some similar verses in his word to warn us about the reality of universal or global destruction. And even those of us who profess to be Christians are susceptible to the, to the deception of Satan. Let's not forget that. Also, Jesus spoke strongly in Mark and I think in Matthew um, about the intensity of the deceptions that's going to come in the last days. When he says that false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the very, even the elite. The false prophets and the false Christ will be so convincing that Christ, uh, that Christians will be deceived if they don't hold on to the truth of God's word. This seems to be a fearful thing, but we don't have to worry about this if we hold on to God's word. I want us to remember that God's word is truth. And we need to do like the, the story in Matthew 7, which talks about the man who built his house on the, on the rock and the one who built their house on the sand. We need to build our house on the rock, Christ Jesus, as recorded in his words. That's the only way we're going to be saved from the deceptions that Satan had. Some of us think that because we are Christians, we will not be subject to these deceptions, but we will. Um, so let's not get fooled and think that we can't be, we can't be deceived because we can if we don't hold on to God's true word. Remember that that's the way Jesus defeated Satan when Satan appeared to him 
in the wilderness. Now, that's the overview of the lesson. And now we're going to get into the deceptions, Brother Ephraim. Deception number one. One of the, uh, the Babylon, the Babylon wine um, used by the devil. He started to use it way back in the Garden of Eden. Um, when in Genesis 3, 4, he looks at Eve and says, did God say that you, if you eat of this fruit, if you, if you, make a decision not to continue to be with God, that you will not surely die, that all lie continues to be used by the evil one, continues to actually to be a demonstration of what Sister Jackson just mentioned, drinking of the wine of Babylon. It's a false teaching. And that false teaching of immorality that the soul will not die is really say, uh, is saying that the spirit continues after physical death. And um, clearly that belief of, 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 immorality, of immortality definitely leads to this doctrine, um, very modern and expanding doctrine of um, spiritualism that one begins to seek if my loved one physically is gone, but her spirit, his or her spirit is still alive, then I can go seeking uh, messages and, and hearing and having visitations from that dead person. And um, that might help me to find solutions for some of the problems. And so that teaching, those two things come together. I'm drinking of the false teaching, that Babylonian wine, that false teaching of um, immortality is mixed with that seeking solutions from those who have gone before into that space of the spiritual realm. In fact, um, Revelation 18, 2 tells us clearly, and from the message it says, uh, of course, we, we know it We know it from the King, King, King James and related translations that says that the angel cried with a loud voice saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, for she has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit. Uh, like the message, it says, ruined, ruined. Great Babylon is ruined. It's now a ghost town for demons. It's all that left. Um, it's a garrison of carrion spirits. It's a, it's, a it's a garrison of loathsome carrion birds. All nations drank the wine of her whoring. Kings of the earth went pouring with her, and entrepreneurs made millions exploiting her. So here, um, again, we see that if something is ruined, um, in this case, the great Babylon, and so all, uh, it's now ruined, then there's spiritual ruin, there's decay, and they're, you know, suggesting that, you know, as it were, there all these, all these carrion birds and, and, and worms and ants. So it's a real mess, yeah? And that's the plight of the world today as um, the world seeks to, um, on this, as the world tr try to match that the, the devil's all lie of immor 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 immortality. And of course, that's spiritual, trying to seek a spiritual life. In fact, um, first, as the, first Timothy 4, 1 says, the spirit makes it clear that as time goes on, some are going to give up on the faith and chase after demonic illusions put forth by professional liars. These liars have lied so well. That's from the message Bible. These liars have lied so well and for so long that they have lost their capacity for truth. And people are turning to these. The, the, Bible, the Bible tells us here clearly in 1 Timothy 4, 1, that people are going to leave the truth and go to uh, uh, accept these false doc doctrines, which of course is the devil's way of getting the rest of the world to drink of the Babylonian wine. So what is the truth? We're saying on the one hand, the devil trick is to say, hey, you can't die. Um, your soul will live on forever. And even and even stretch it to say, if you die in the well, if you die having accepted, if you die, then of course you go straight to heaven and 
all kinds of things. In fact, I went to one funeral once. Um, the lady was known for the dishes she cooked. And the minister is saying, um, uh, call the person's name. She's now in heaven. God called her home because God wanted her to cook some curry chicken for her, for him. Um, that's the kind, you know, and we make light of that. Um, and that false doctrine is spreading. So what is the truth on the other hand? The Bible tells us, according to the word of God, Ecclesiastes 9.3, for the living, you and I know that we will die. And um, in fact, if I go back to Genesis 3.4, when the, when the devil was questioning Eve, if God said, uh, if God said you will die, and he said, you will not surely die, you know, it was the dying in all of the dimensions, physical, spiritual, um, of course, uh, relational and everything else. And we experience that in our lives. Um, so here, Ecclesiastes 9 is saying, the wise man is saying, for the living know that they shall die. Physically, we all expect that. Well. Um, we expect that. But the dead know nothing. In other words, when a person dies, he or she cannot come back and bring no messages to you. When a person dies, the Bible says, the word of God says, the truth of the word of God says, you die and you will go in, you will remain in your grave until Christ comes back. When Christ comes back, either in the first or second resurrection, then there would be that, well, in the first resurrection at least, there's going to be that restoration of life. And then you will live eternally with King Jesus. So there's a solution. If you really want to believe that you can live eternally, one must give his or her heart and obedience to King Jesus. And when he comes the first time, he's going to raise you and have you live with him eternally. Um, Psalms 115 of verse 17 says, when you're dead, even when, when a person dies physically, um, that the dead cannot praise God, nor any who go down into silence cannot do praise God, cannot make new decisions, cannot bring information to you. So the only solution apparently is to give one's life to King Jesus now. Let him take control. Surrender to him and surrender your thoughts. So forget about the, the, the well, recognize that the, the devil continues to lie as he did to Eve and say, look, you can live on forever. Um, that's the devil's, oh, that's drinking of the wine of the Babylon. Um, that's false teaching. The truth of the word of God is when you die, you cannot make new decisions. Your soul does not live on. You, your soul, you cannot bring back messages and strength and support for those you have left behind. The only support you can give to those who you're leaving behind will let them know King Jesus as their Lord and the Savior. Tuesdays? Um, Tuesday's lesson, the topic will be the center of sun worship. Genesis 9, 6 pretty much just states that man was made in God's image. First Chronicles 16, 29 states, give unto the Lord the glory due to his name, worship the Lord in beauty of holiness. God has put in us the desire to worship, to worship our creator. And if we do not worship our true God, we're gonna worship someone else or we're going to worship something else. <laughs> this lesson is about the spiritual Babylon, which represents a false religious system. And the focus will be on sun worship. Given you a historical account, how this all got started, sun day being the first day of the week was put aside to worship the sun deity or the sun gods. And the, the origin of sun worship originated in Babylon. The Bible states in Genesis 10, 8 to 12, that the Bible character associated with sun worship was Nimrod. Nimrod was looked at 
as indicated in Genesis as a mighty one, a powerful one, having a lot of authority, along with his wife who was worshiped as the queen of heaven, they had a son named Tamaz. Tamaz was worshiped as a child with divine origin. He was worshiped as a child that represents a solar image. And he was also worshiped as the promised Messiah for the fallen race of mankind. Can you believe that? But that was the false counterfeit that was started, that started the original sun worship coming out of Babylon. So we can say sun worship was really the earliest idolatry. We can say that Babylon is the mother of all harlot religions and all the pagan abomination and false worship systems ex that exist on this earth comes out of Babylon. Now we know sun worship was a very prominent religion even at the time of Christ. And sun, and sun worship was a very powerful um, component in the Roman uh, religion. But at the time of Emperor Const Constantine, he reigned from 306 to 337. At his time, Constantine got converted to Christianity. And what he really wanted was to get all of Rome to accept Christianity the way he did. So he initiated or he wrote an edict and the edict was written in AD 321, but it wasn't um, a law that talked about having to worship on Sunday. His edict was basically, it reformed what one does on Sunday. And that edict was, we all know that Sunday was the day that all the sun gods were worshiped. So he pretty much said in his edict, well, you know, you can worship, uh, you can have your Christian practice on Sunday as well. And that's what his edict was about. You don't have to worship on Saturday. You can worship on the first day of week. So in order to make Christianity acceptable to the Roman citizens, he went ahead and incorporated the practice of Christianity on the principles of sun worship. He laid that foundation in the fourth century in Rome. So what the result of that was, now understand, the festivals, the rituals, the holidays, the worship, everything that the pagan sun worshipers did, the Christ practice of Christianity was laid on top of that. They did not destroy buildings and put up new buildings for Christian worship. They pretty much used the same temples that the, the sun worshipers did. They may have changed some of the sun worshiper statues and put in Christian statues, but what they did was in incorporating the Christian practice, they maintain all the, the rituals, the holidays, the special days, everything that was done in pagan sun worship so it will be easier to accept Christianity. So the foundation of Christianity that was laid in the fourth century under Constantine was laid right on top of the sun worship principles. So we need to understand that. And that was just the beginning because it actually went so well. Now understand his edict was also twofold. It wasn't not only to make Christianity more uh, accepting to the Roman citizens, it was also to identify the difference between the Jews that were worshiping on the seventh day Sabbath. That was also something he wanted to identify the difference from the seventh day Sabbath to everybody worshiping on Sunday. Um, since it really went well, um, I would say that we can look at what Constantine did as maybe the first Sunday law, but by AD 336, 
the church actually established its first law concerning worshiping on Sunday. And that was done in the Council of Lacedia in AD 337. The document where the church talks about worshiping is to be done on Sunday is in the Canon 29, which was done at that council. So that's history that I wanted to share with you. Let's talk about Israel. Israel also had to deal with sun worshiping. And at that time, as indicated in the Bible, if you read through Judges, First and Second Kings, and the Chronicles, you would see that there was a constant constant back and forth between the Israelites worshiping the true God and then incorporating Babel or sun worship into their, into their religion. And what God was trying to do was get the people to understand and to move them away from the Babylonian worship or Baal worship or the sun worship at that time. If we look at Ezekiel 8.16, the Jewish people became corrupted by worshiping the sun as the Babylonians and other nations around them did. The prophet Ezekiel, God gave him a vision and gave him a vision for him to see what was taking place. Um, he wanted Ezekiel to see that the elders were turning their backs toward the temple, the backs, their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. They were including sun worshiping in the temple. And the vision that God gave Ezekiel, it was for him to understand that and to deal with that so he can pull the people away from worshiping the sun. That's in Ezekiel 8.16. Then if you go into um, 2 Kings 23 and read from verse five to 11, we see King Josiah was on a mission to get the Israelites away from worshiping Baal and to purge sun worshiping from Jerusalem and from Judah. So our takeaway in all of this is that what do we do? What do we keep in mind when it comes to this? We need to understand that just like the Hebrew boys who were decreed to worship the golden image, so in our last days, the spiritual Babylon will have us worship a false image. We'll be forced to decide whether we worship the true God that made heaven and earth and rested on the seventh day or worship the beast in his image. So the question that we need to always be asking ourselves with everything that we taking place and the changes that are taking place in the world around us, who will we worship? Brother Charles. Thanks. Um, good, great, great, uh, great lead in. So my comments will be fairly brief since, since uh, Ms. Robinson kind of covered um, some of the historical aspects of um, the true day of rest. Wednesday's lesson is entitled A Call to Faithfulness. And faithful, faithfulness in, in, one co in what context, one might ask. Um, but it's in exactly the context that uh, Ms. Robinson was suggesting. Um, the lesson calls us to be faithful to the concept of seventh-day Sabbath worship with the seventh day being regarded as the true day of rest. Why is that important? Well, according to the lesson, the pervasiveness of Sunday Sabbath worship as the sanctified day of rest is another one of Satan's deceptions, even among the elect, the faithful ones, as described in Mark 13, 22 and Matthew 24, 31. I remember having discussions many times in my youth with my uh, Catholic and Protestant Christian friends. Um, if God himself rested on the seventh day, I would argue, why would he have us worship and rest on another day? 
six days shall thou labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. The Bible teaches in the commandments. The seventh day is the day of rest. Even in Spanish, the seventh day of the week, Saturday is Sabado. Sabado. Reflecting yeah. the historical knowledge of a seventh day Sabbath, even among a population that largely worships on a Sunday, right? Spanish speakers um, that, that might be largely Catholic. My friends would argue that a seven day Sabbath is a Jewish custom and we all know what the Jews did. Um, in addition, Sunday was the day that Jesus rose from the dead, a celebration of new life, of his grace, of, of, of a commemoration of, of him dying for our sins, obviously Sunday worship makes more sense, they would argue. You seven days are crazy. That's what they would, that's what they would tell me back home. You seven days are crazy. Um, but while my friends acknowledge the strength of the words that came from the Bible, in the end, we mostly agreed to disagree on this doctrinal point, and then you know, we moved on. The reality is that in days of back in those days, you know, very little internet. Um only students of history and theology would have, would really have known of the origins of Sunday worship as Ms. Robinson described, right? They, they didn't necessarily know, and I didn't necessarily know at the time that, G, that, that Sunday worship really had nothing to do with Jesus's death and resurrection, mm -hmm. at least originally, um, that wasn't the argument for it at all, right? Um, as noted earlier, the Constantine, convert, uh, a, a, a convert to Christianity, introduced this first civil le legislation around uh, resting on a Sunday. All work should cease on a Sunday, um, except for farmers, if necessary. Right. Um, I was doing some research, and I came across even some more recent theories that suggested that Jesus himself left the door open for the adoption of Sunday worship, considering his own Sabbath day activities, um, you know, where the Pharisees would accuse him of, you know, healing the sick and, 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 and doing good on the Sabbath. Um, you know, the argument was that, you know, the, the, the Sabbath was associated with a day of restrictions versus Sunday, which was regarded as a day associated with the resurrection. My simple reading of the Bible suggests that while Jesus disagreed with the Pharisaic interpretation of how the Sabbath was kept, Jesus never denounced the Sabbath. Instead, he provided numerous examples of how the Sabbath could be kept effectively. It appears to me that this doctrinal point on Sabbath keeping is incredibly important uh, to God because it's reinforced over and over and over again in the Bible. It's one of the 10 specific points that he mentions, one of the 10 commandments. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Don't work or have others work within your gates on the Sabbath. Um, Ezekiel 20, 1 to 20, uh, reminds us numerous times. Um, and then in Ezekiel 20, 20, stating one final time, Hallow my Sabbath, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. While questions may linger about the practical execution of this Bible commandment, if God impressed upon Ezekiel, Moses, and others, and if Jesus himself kept the Sabbath holy as he lived on earth, then clearly we should be making every effort to obey God's direct command by doing the same. True. And with, with that, um, we'll segue into, into obedience with uh, Miss Leisha. Thank you, Brother Charles. So that's a great segue into a call to obedience. So it, we are reminded that the remnant who are faithful to God's doctrines are only a small portion of the people of God. Most of them are still inside Babylon. And as Sister Jackson alluded to earlier, that Babylon is representative of religious leadership that teaches false doctrines. So they're not aware that they're worshiping God on the wrong day or that they're accepting Satan's deceptions as true. 
Therefore, they need someone to teach the truth and invite them to exit Babylon or to turn away from their false doctrines and beliefs. All faithful people must be taught that obedience just reflects the grace of Christ who liberates us from condemnation and the dominion of sin if we are faithful. So that reminds us as well that in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, we are reminded <clears throat> that if we commit sin, we are not following God's law. Additionally, in James chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, it says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So this concept lets us know that if we disobey even one of God's laws, that we are guilty of disobeying them all. So how does this transcend to our church life? So if one of our brothers or sister, as an example, has an affair or versus another one that commits murder with their words, lying, creating chaos or gossip or discord within the church or their church family, which sin is greater? Another example would be if we have a member or one of our brothers and sisters boasting or bragging about their accomplishments, their wealth, and how many things that they have accomplished in this life versus looking down on others and demeaning other people instead of helping them with the things that God has blessed them with. So we would also look at that and versus stealing. Which one would you say is the greater sin? Well, some might say in the first example, well, of course, having the affair would be worse than murdering with your words. Or you might say in the second example, well, of course, stealing is the greater sin versus boasting and bragging about your accomplishments and looking down on others. But we do have to remember that in God's view, we all have sinned and each yes. sin is equal and we are all in need of asking for forgiveness, his grace and repenting from what is wrong. So let us be careful when we are judging each other. Next, we also need someone to teach them that the truth, teach them the truth and invite them to exit out of Babylon. So in Romans chapter 14, verses 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, but he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. Therefore, be careful to observe all of God's statutes. Also, heaven has an appeal to his people in the church. So according to the Bible study guide's teacher, it says that Heaven's appeal to his people in churches that do not respect and obey the law of God is to step out by faith. His appeal to Adventist and Sabbath-keeping congregations is to forsake all self-centered human attempts at obedience and live godly lives by faith in the grace of Christ, which delivers us from sin's condemnation and its domination. And just as Israel's faithfulness to the law would have been a powerful witness to the world, our faithfulness too can be a powerful witness and help guide people out of Babylon. So how do we do that in a practical way? We have that can be done in a variety of ways. We can be kind to others. We can show grace when a unintentional mistake occurs in the church or on our job. We can show forgiveness when someone close to us in our family or our friends hurts us deeply. We can help those in need in the church and outside of the church. We can give a smile or a compliment to someone, giving sacrificially to help further the work of God and being respectful with our words, even when we are angry, even when we have the right to feel that way, and lastly, doing the right thing when it is a hard thing to do, and even sometimes when no one is looking but God. Mm -hmm. So in closing, the people we come in contact throughout each week should be able to <laughs> notice God's spirit living and moving through us each and every day and in every deed that we do and every word that we say. 
And that leads us to our takeaway. Our takeaway is coming to us from Selected Messages, uh, book two. It reads as follows. The wine of Babylon is the exalting of the false and spurious Sabbath above the Sabbath, which the Lord Jehovah has blessed and sanctified for the use of man. Also, it is the immortality of the soul. These kindred heresies and the rejection of the truth convert the church into Babylon, kings, merchants, rulers, and religious teachers are all in corrupt harmony. What a sober thought in terms of the day and the time that we lived in. For the jokes, you're on mute. Shall we pray, please? Almighty God, we thank you for this year, Holy Sabbath day. We thank you for your written word. We thank you for writing your words on our hearts as we grow in deeper relationship with you. And even in these end times, you've given us some warnings. And the wine of Babylon that the nation is drinking is because the devil is intensifying his effort in order to deceive others and to rob them of a high healthy relationship with you and so he's using wrong he's using his false teachings on on the mortality or the immortality of the soul and of the sabbath and someone has heard this teaching tonight that there is a truth from your word and wants to make a new decision to honor your holy sabbath to come out of babylon and do and worship you, accept your Holy Sabbath as your written word, as your desire for our lives, to transform our lives. And that someone also is wanting to escape the false teaching of the immortality of the soul. Sit beside some, that someone right now. May that person and each of us experience your visitation so that we will be strengthened in knowing your truth of the Sabbath, in knowing your truth that is only at your next coming, at your coming, that the soul that accepts you as Lord and Savior will be able to live eternally with you. It's a beautiful experience we want to look forward to. So bless hearts and give us the strength. We receive your divine grace as we worship you during this thy holy Sabbath. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen, amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on this grave subject of the deceptions of our enemy, our adversary, Satan, in these days. I pray that what has been shared with you today will give you information and be aware that we are living in perilous times. But at this time, we'd like to share with you our mission spotlight. Mm -hmm. Open up our Let there be no Open up our Do not And so can I your call to share you and Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you for joining us in our interactive Sabbath School class today. We appreciate your participation in our virtual Sabbath School. Join us next week as we continue to discuss three cosmic messages. Stay tuned for our next service.